Thank you, John. I don't know what John's talking about. I think in a tough deal here, you were as smooth as silk. Your voice was on point the whole time. You were generous in talking about how the pastor forget to pr forget, forgot to pray by saying, you know, just everything's kind of out of order. You were so kind to protect me there. But thanks so much for serving. Um, uh, what a blessing. Uh, it was just wonderful. Sharing your piano playing was just lovely. And we appreciate you sharing that with us. Our, we're, our numbers are few, but uh, it's good to gather in the presence of the Lord. We've been working our way through Matthew, and we've just finished a section of Matthew where the Lord has pretty much read the riot act to the leaders in Jerusalem. And he's come down pretty harshly on them. He's talked uh, very pointedly about where they stand in relation to him. And those that would stand rightly uh, stand with broken, repentant hearts. So here they are with another opportunity to maybe uh, straighten themselves out. But instead of repenting, they've decided that, again, we've known this for a long time in Matthew, it was their goal to, to trip up Jesus, to catch him up and to, to figure out a way uh, to, to eliminate him. Uh, they had uh, given the works that Jesus had been doing, and they assigned them to Satan, as you remember earlier in, in Matthew. And Jesus has already told us that, that they're going to take him by evil hands and crucify those leaders in, in Jerusalem. But here we are again, after we've left that section, now here they are. We're going to have three weeks of them trying to trip the Lord up and in, in, in catch him. Uh, the thing about Jesus is he's perfect truth. There is absolutely no one that can find anything in him. He's the perfect, perfect sinless Lamb of God. Uh, he never sins, he never goes wrong, and even in this, as they try to trip him up here today, we're going to find that as they're trying to, to patronize him, that they actually have a good handle on who Jesus is. Uh, but here we see the Pharisees are going to plot against him and, and try to take him and, and do him in. So let's stand as we read this portion of scripture. Uh, we're going to see in this portion of scripture how we can recognize authority and how we're called to properly respond to authority. How to recognize authority and how to properly respond to it. It's going to be Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. This is the word of God. <clears throat> So here we are. It's an interesting thing when the Pharisees now are joining with the Herodians in order to try to trip up Jesus. These groups of, of men do not normally get along. The Pharisees are the, the Bible guys who have added to what they believe in the scripture their own interpretations. It's very much like the Catholic Church that has the Bible, but then they add their own interpretations, councils and popes and so forth. And that's what has happened with the Pharisees over the years. Jesus always commends them when they are lined up with the scriptures, but he's hard on them, of course, when they deviate from the word of God. Not to mention their hearts are wicked, these guys. The Herodians are much more politically minded. They're a group that have aligned themselves with Herod, and Herod, you know, would always do whatever he could to work with, with the Roman 
in government, however it would benefit him, and that's where the Herodians are, however it can benefit them. So again, these are the two groups and they've come together. And they've got a real tough task, because they're gonna try to trip up the King of Kings, the man who is truth incarnate, the Lord Jesus. So they've got a tough task. You know, they gather themselves and they go, what are we gonna do? What, 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 how can we catch this guy? And, and they're going to come at him in a, in a very uh, particular way to try to trip him up. Um, but it's interesting that the Pharisees, they, they now are going to send other folks to do their dirty work. Their disciples are sent, as well as the Herodians. So here we're going to find uh, that uh, there's three different points I want to find here. I want to see the ability to discern authority. I want to see earthly authority. And I want to see heavenly authority. First of all, the ability to discern uh, authority. These disciples and Pharisees and Herodians come to Jesus, and they're buttering them up, it seems. You know you know, if you've ever gone to someone out there, James, you're just such a wonderful guy, and, and we just love being around you, and you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, well, what is it? And, and it's pretty tough for folks to come up with things to butter me up with, because where are you going? If there's enough things they can come up with that I've got trouble with. But when they come to Jesus and they're buttering him up, it's really interesting, because I think they really clearly lay out who Jesus is. Uh, they're being completely patronizing, but, but look, at what we, look at what they discover about Jesus. If you've got your word of God open on your lap, they say, teacher, we know that you are true. Is there anyone else more true than the Lord Jesus? There is no other truer man. And they see you are true, and you teach the way of God in truth, no doubt. Jesus is out and about showing the world exactly what God means, exactly what the truth that God means to reveal to the world. Here Jesus is explicating it. You teach the way of God in truth. And then at the end there it says, you do not regard the person of men. So, and Jesus is not a respecter of persons. These are all things that are, are, are indicative of the person and work of Jesus. He didn't care that he'd be in direct mortal danger by coming against the Pharisees. Remember, he just walked around and they were, they were amazed. The authority with which he enacted everything that he did. So it's just funny to me that, that in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Lord, in how amazing his word is, we're able to learn something from these patronizing disciples of the Pharisees and Herodians that are there to completely trip up our Lord. Uh, it's just interesting to me. Number one, we want to learn that Jesus is true. As Francis Schaeffer would say, Scripture is true truth, right? It, it's, you know, you see in the Bible, the Lord is holy, holy, holy. I mean, true truth. It's, it's so true, you say it again. Jesus is true truth. And they say, teacher, we know that you are true. Uh, they may have been there the day that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I don't know if they were just trying to to catch them up, but man, they got to the, the heart of who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus was sta is standing in the, in, in the, later on in front of Pilate in the Gospel of, of John, and, and he says, For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who, hear, who, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And there's Pilate, dumbfounded. What is truth? Truth is a hard thing to come by, folks. You, you don't find it on every street corner. You don't find it in schools. You don't find it anywhere. But here we find it in the person and work of Jesus. He is truth. So they nailed it. Perfectly. Secondly, if someone wants to know how to discern authority, then they would need to know the way that God the Father has laid out for us. If you want to know, because we want to know what's authority. They're going to, the whole idea here and the point of this is what's true authority? We're going to have the authority of the world uh, uh, in juxtaposition to the authority of heaven. How are we going to know what authority is? We need to know it from the Father. The Pharisees, they distorted truth constantly. But Jesus was consistent. You couldn't trip them up. You know when someone's talking truth, it's, it's hard to trip them up. Because you know what? They're just telling the truth. Someone who lies, you can always find little little faux pas. You know, sadly, you think about someone who's trying to get one over on someone else, and they just start building these stories, 
and you can catch it. You just know it. You can almost hear it. Jesus just exudes truth. He, he, he explains the truth of the Father perfectly. Thirdly, they commend Jesus because they see he has no regard for men. And, and this is where we need to be. Our regard should not be for men. Fear of man, boy, does not Jesus show that, but it's fear for God. It's concern for the truth that God reveals to us, things that Jesus is laying out. So if anybody can answer this difficult question, I think Jesus is equipped to. I'd say, bravo, boys. You know, you've exactly laid out where I am. Uh, but, you know, so, so they say, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And see, this is a very critical thing here. They are looking to trip up Jesus. And we know that during this time and space, it's a very uh, volatile time. They are under Roman occupation. They're paying a poll tax. And, and the, in Jerusalem, all the Jewish folks are required to pay a poll tax. They're not real happy about it. I don't know about you, I'm not real happy about some of the tax, taxes I have to pay. But it's not the same thing as what we see here, a Roman occupation <coughs> over these guys. So, so if he were to say, definitely it's not right to, 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 uh, to pay taxes, they turn them right over to the Romans and they'd be done with them. And as a matter of fact, they even lie about that before Pilate down the road to get them turned in because they can't find anything. But if he goes the other way and says um, it's, it, it is right to pay taxes, and come on now, of course all the zealots that are traveling around, he's going to lose those folks. And he's going to be at odds with one or the other. All these guys want to do is cause trouble and put Jesus at odds. So, so they've sent him as they think, between a rock and a hard place. But Jesus has a way of, of getting out from under here. Uh, he's going to come up with a third way to answer these guys. So, so first I wanted to see there that, that there is a way to discern a, authority. And man, you want to discern authority, you're going to discern it from the person of Jesus who is truth, him explicating the Father's truth, and the fact of him just not being a respecter of persons. And I think if you look at those three traits, those are all things that we should be striving for as we're praying and hoping that we might be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. This is the image and likeness of Christ. Uh, so secondly here, we have earthly authority. Uh, Tiberius Caesar was the most powerful ruler at that time, and Jerusalem was occupied, as I said, by the Roman nation. The presence of this Roman occupation uh, was not exactly welcomed by the masses. It was a very difficult time. We heard a little bit last week about Jesus talking about the judgment that would come on Jerusalem. That judgment finally came out of a revolt over taxes that ended up in the Jewish wars and ended up at 70 AD. So, so these are the kind of volatile things that they, they're laying out before Jesus. Uh, they thought that they had given Jesus only two choices, both of which were going to put him into deep trouble. Does anybody have a quarter or a silver dollar? No one carries coins anymore, right? Come on, someone's got to have a quarter. All right, let's, well, we look for one. Canon, if, if, uh, if Mrs. Ordway has one, no? There is a dime. Go grab that dime for me, Canon. So they're going to say, and Jesus says to me, show me the tax money. Show me the tax money. And you know on our coins, we've got pictures of former dead presidents. We've got George Washington on one. We've got Thomas Jefferson, uh, Eisenhower. And, and in our, on our coins, you'll see the head of that president. You'll see in God we trust. So here Jesus is asking them for... Uh, uh, one of the coins that they're using to pay tax with. Get, show me one of the coins. He doesn't have one with him. See these denarius, that was a Roman coin, okay? And, and they were supposed to be all so holy because there was a Jewish form of money that the Romans allowed them to use so that they might not break their own godly laws. But someone was able to produce one right away. So they flip one to it, and on one side would have been the head of Tiberius Caesar, okay? He's the Caesar at the time, and on the other side of that coin would be son of a god, Augustus Caesar. You see, they, they, they declared that their Caesars were actually little g gods. 
Um, and that's what they would have. So here Jesus is. He's got the coin. And I'll give you your dime back later. <laughs> uh, and, and this is what he's going to use as an example. Uh, as we've learned about the denarius, this Roman coin, it was a silver, it was a silver coin. It, it, was, it, it was the payment that they would use for a day's labor. And, and so there you go. Now Jesus says, so render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, because it's got the inscription and the head of Caesar on it, and give to God what is God. So there, are there not earthly authorities that we need to obey? Jesus didn't say, you know what, Resurrect, uh, insurrection, right? He didn't say, let's revolt, time to go revolt. Of course, they had liked and would have loved that that would be, and earlier in his ministry, when they came to see Jesus, he's raising people from the dead, they thought, this is the Messiah. And what was the Messiah going to do? Deliver them from Rome and set up his earthly kingdom right then. But you see, Jesus had something much more. So, but there are earthly uh, authorities that we need to adhere to. I believe that last week we saw what Jesus prophesied, that actually the Roman occupying armies of Titus and Vespasian will be God's tool to bring judgment on first century Judaism at 70 AD. It says he, speaking of God, will send his armies to destroy and burn that city. God in history of Israel has used heathen nations to bring judgment. We saw it with the Assyrians, we saw it with the Babylonians, and we see it here with the Roman armies. So, so there is something much deeper, and we do recognize the importance of civil government. We see it today. You know, and you think about taxes. I've been involved in churches where they want to start a, uh, a income tax revolt. Or there's all different things where they get all mixed up in the, the things going on now, and their focus in their heart is on heavenly authority, excuse me, earthly authority, and on the things of the earth. And we've seen it throughout the Sermon on the Mount. God's calling us to have a vision of a heavenly vision as opposed to earthly. So, so here we are, right? And Jesus is laying out for us uh, a, a pattern of how we should react to the earthly authority. We know that scripture, uh, in scripture, God is the one that ordains civil government. We've seen that uh, Peter and Paul both are gonna comment on civil authorities. I think partially Peter, directly from what he hears here from the Lord, and obviously the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but in Romans 13, 1, uh, Paul says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Down in verse four, for he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So I think we don't see a pattern for revolt in the scriptures. We actually see a call to submit to proper civil authorities. Now listen, today I do not want to make this a political debate where we're going to get into all the nuances of when you stand up against civil authority because there's time to do that. I think at our nation's uh, birth, they, they found a, a way that they felt it was right to stand up against King George. And so, so there's time for that and there's a way to do it properly. But on what I'm going to see here in this scripture, in order to be able to do that, you're going to have to be able to do what we see here. Now, hang with me a little bit so that we might know if there's ever that time to do that. God ordains civil government to bear the sword, does he not? You kill someone, it's kind of good that we've got the police to come down the road and maybe catch that guy. It's kind of good that there's taxes that we use to pay the policemen to do their work. I think that's important. So I don't think, in general, Scripture is calling us to revolt. And, and what I want to uh, start to see, well, let me not think ahead of myself. Let me go now to Peter. If you want to follow along, I'm in 1 Peter 2.13. 1 Peter 2.13. I think we're going to see Peter learning something from this little episode as he's sitting there with the Lord, hearing all of his ministry, seeing this dialogue with these uh, disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, Oh my goodness, Peter, have you, not, have you not seen what government can do? And I just want to give you a little bit of an aside. Both Paul and Peter are recommending submitting to authority, which happens to be, during their time of the writing, Nero Caesar. 
who is one of the most brutal emperors of all time, who ends up martyring both of those men. When the Roman uh, city burned in 64 AD, Nero blamed the Christians. And they lit Christians up as lamps in his garden. So listen, this is a bad guy. But here Peter is saying, therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man. And then a little bit later, 13 and 14, whether to the kings as supreme, king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So there you have it. I think, again, these men, in one of the most depraved uh, kings and rulers of all time, recommending that we are not uh, looking to revolt. And again, this is not my point here. My point is the scripture clearly shows us that. God has placed civil government in authority for a reason. And you know what? We are not growing up in Rome or in Jerusalem, okay? We're not under Roman occupation. We live in a country that I actually think is our law and the way we run government was learned from the scriptures. Representative government by which we can vote for our representatives. You know, every time, uh, I, a lot of folks are very unhappy with certain leaders, are they not? I was not the biggest fan of President Obama, but I prayed for him faithfully, and I respected him and his office. We see it on the other side of the ledger, don't we now? People that just can't stand our president, and they're disrespectful. I don't care about them disagreeing with the president. Feel free to disagree, okay? But do it respectfully, do it rightly. Don't, don't cause what we're seeing in our culture. Uh, we've got a horrific um, leaders in certain places that I, uh, well, I shouldn't say horrific them, but, but their policies are really bad. We live in a, a state which is, it made some very, makes some very difficult decisions. I think that make it hard on man, but, but I think we live in, still live in a time when we can vote, vote, vote them out, vote someone else in. We, we're able to pray. What's the, what does Peter, what does T uh, Timothy say? Therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So there's no doubt I see that they're seeing the importance of earthly civil government. We see the importance of earthly civil government today. The fact that we need to give respect to them and how we deal with ourselves. But I'd submit to you, the government's rise and fall as God declares and when and how. And, and what's going to be very important for us to be able to deal with and understand how to react to authority properly and or if ever it comes a time that God calls us, is what Peter said, what is it right? And they told him, do not preach in the name of Jesus. He says, whether it seems right to you or not, we cannot but obey God. Is it better to obey man or to obey God? And it's a fine line at times when you've got to draw that line. I know in our nation they're making laws that are, that are difficult. Laws that if they try to tell me what I need to preach from the pulpit, I'm not going to listen to them, even if they're going to arrest me. But we're going to see where we head with that. But God is greater. What I'm going to see here is in point three, heavenly authority. You can't understand how to properly uh, evaluate or have wisdom about earthly authority until you are rendering the things that are God's properly. Render to Caesar those things that are Caesar's. There's, there's, it's right. And, and deal with it. But you know what? Until you are rendering your whole heart, mind, and soul to God, you won't be able to properly even understand where you're headed with that. The focus here is Jesus is not telling us about how we're going to evade our taxes or how we're going to start a tax revolt or, or, or some of the things you see folks getting up in arms about. What we need to get up in arms about is falling in love with God and rendering everything to God. If we rightly render ourselves completely to God, then we'll find that we're going to be sensitive to his leadings, no matter what it is. But there's going to be a way in which God calls his people to act and move and live and have their being as we interact with, with, with other citizens, as we interact with the government. But, but again, and two, what you end up seeing with these folks is earthly kingdoms and earthly um, uh, citizenry ends up 
being more important than their citizenship in heaven. And if we're rendering everything to God, what's most important to us is our citizenship in heaven. I, I'm glad I'm American. I'm glad I was born here. I, I'm patriotic. I love July 4th, and I celebrate with the, with, the, with the fireworks. But you know what? I'm first and foremost a child of the living God. I render myself completely to him, okay? When, when, and I don't know who I first heard preach it, but when he holds up that coin and says, whose image in the inscription, okay? Every person ever born has the image and likeness and inscription of Almighty God imprinted on them. And they owe him allegiance. And if they're not giving him allegiance, they're going to answer to that. We as Christians who put faith in Christ, if indeed you put faith in Christ, you need to realize that the image that really matters is the image of Christ in us, the image of God planted upon us. It's all thrown out of whack in the garden. Everything goes topsy-turvy, upside down. There was a time when we walked with God in the cool of the day in, in, in a relationship that was, was right and true. We bore the image of God, and, and God himself walked with us. That image was, was marred. Not beyond a recognition, but it was marred. And here we go. I left out, if someone was really really astute in reading those scriptures from Peter and, and Paul, I left out some very important parts that they include. Because I think the parts they include when they mention those things about submitting, paying tax, honoring the king, they do it recognizing how important the second part of this is, the heavenly authority. Uh, look at Romans 13.1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. God puts governments. Governments rise and fall. The Son of God sits at the right hand of God and laughs. He will have his way. We need to make God first. If there ever comes a time we've got to make hard decisions and stand up against civil government, i got news for you. We better be doing it from a heart of love and commitment to God. We had better have already completely rendered ourselves completely his so that we can be able to do that. We're able to do the right thing when it comes to earthly authority only after we've put God as the proper authority in our lives. Is God everything to us? I seem to ask this every week. But you know what? Our hearts are an idol factory trying to draw us away into everything and away from God. When you wake up in the morning, what makes your motor go? What are you excited about? We had better be excited about our love for God in our relationship with the Father through the Son. If all of that is in order, when the time comes, if the time comes, how the time comes, we'll be able to react properly, no matter what it was. And I don't have enough time to go back into the Revolutionary War, but I know there were many preachers and pastors that were, were a big part of the Revolution. Uh, but I, I guarantee if they were doing it right, they loved the Lord. There were a lot of generals and people that, that formed our country that really loved the Lord. I've read a biography of George Washington. I get the impression he really loved the Lord. Um, I, I've read others, uh, Thomas Jefferson, not so much. He, he was a deist or, or, or Benjamin Franklin. But when it comes right down to it, it, it the, the really the kingdom that matters is not the kingdom of America. The kingdom that matters is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven that's at hand. I believe that every tribe, tongue, and nation, and kingdom, and political entity can have blessing. You know how they're going to have it? Not through political activism, through the prosperity of the gospel, through the gospel going forward. A man changes from a, a, a horrific hypocrite who, who only imposes laws that are horrible to someone who will impose right laws when he comes in right order with God. Citizenry is changed through revival. We saw it in the 1700s under Jonathan Edwards. We're not going to change the world by being an active uh, uh, po politically. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be active politically. We need to be. We need to be praying for our leaders. We need to be as active as we can be for righteousness. And we see it. We get to stand up for life um, when we look for, for those leaders that would, I think, at the very basic, if you're a leader and you believe in killing children, I can't get with, I don't care what else you're doing, 
I just can't get with you. So I, I think there's things that we need to be active with. We need to, there's a New York State uh, Christian uh, lobby that, that tells us of all the different um, uh, uh, debates that are out there, the things that are being voted on, this and that, where the different candidates stand. Be informed. Be informed. But don't be overwhelmed. Don't go to sleep one night. I remember when President Clint, uh, Clinton was elected, you know, I was in a group of, of Christians that were so politically active and thought that was the end of the world. It's not. Jesus is still at the right hand of the Father. I don't care who's elected. His kingdom is going to come, and every knee is going to bow. In the meantime, I believe the transforming power of the gospel, men and women who are on fire for the Lord Jesus, who love God with all their heart, who share the gospel with their neighbors, who see and pray that God might bring revival, we can see our nation change. We can. And, and I believe there are scriptures that talk about the knowledge of the truth of the Lord covering the, the earth as the water does the sea. I don't think that's just the second coming. I told you I believe more in a post-millennial view of eschatology. I believe that there's going to be, the gospel is going to go, go into all the world, preach the gospel, making disciples of every nation, tribe, tongue, kindred. You, may, you do that work, and you're going to see people's, people groups change. I hear about missionaries in horrific places where the, the people are treated terribly. There's no marriages, and, and just the whole of society is crumbling, and the gospel gets a foothold, and it changes people. The gospel, to me, is the power to change. Listen, I'm very patriotic. I love my country. I'm thankful for the country God's given me. But, uh, but as Peter said, we are pilgrims. We are soldiers on our way to uh, Emmanuel's land. And, and in the meantime, we need to be faithful. But, but listen, this isn't it. This is not the new creation right now. This is not heaven on earth. This, you know, there's a lot of folks that, that saw America as the promised land. And, and in some ways, maybe they can make those correlations, but, but that's not. The promised land is coming at the second coming. And, and for, for between now and then, let's be on fire for the Lord. Let's love the Lord with our whole heart. Uh, and, and, and God can change, and God can bring revival. It's not going to be because of whatever president's elected. Now, God can stem the tides of, 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 of evil by raising up men. That, 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 and women that would, would be good legislators. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for our leaders now. You know what? Pray that they might be saved. Pray that they might come into a relationship with the living God. I got news for you. They'll turn from one type of, of leader to a much better one, I suspect. Or they might decide it's time to quit, quit politics and go preach the gospel. <laughs> so... So we're headed for sweet Emmanuel's land. Just across the river comes neither sin nor death, but God's peace forever. In that land, blessed land, just beyond the river, Jesus Christ, our Savior, King, lives and reigns forever. We shall see our Savior, King, know and love him forever. That's our hope. Our hope isn't, my hope isn't, you know, in America I trust. I like that they put that on the money. In God I trust. And it shouldn't be just trust, but we need to render everything. So let's just cover quickly. Uh, I covered what Peter and Paul said. So there's another step of this, this rendering everything to, to, for, to God. And I think this will lead very well into our, our table and, and the Lord's Supper. Is, is This week is about Christ purchasing a bride. We've heard talk of a bridegroom. And a bride. Uh, I think if you look through the whole uh, of Scripture, you see that the bride is making herself ready. Well, you know what? The bride is made ready by the bridegroom this week, and he purchases a people for himself with his own blood. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6:20 says, "For you were bought at a price; therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's." How can you more better render to God than just by recognizing you're not your own? Oh, but I live in the land of the free, the home of the brave. If you're a Christian, you're no longer free. 
You are slaves to Christ. At least that's how we should be acting, because we've been bought with a price. Render ourselves to Christ completely. May we be the slaves that have been purchased at an incredibly high price. We need to recognize that. Um, and let's move down to the, the table now as we continue with this. Uh, John, if you could pull the table out.